So we're now going to hear from three education leaders, each with a specific set of ap actions that are helping to advance edu education beyond high school. So we invited our panelists up to, to share their stories and insights on what actions they can take and what actions we all can be thinking about uh, to ensure that Arizona is able to take advantage of the gains of a more educated citizenry. So with us up on the stage, we have John Arnold of the Arizona Board of Regents. Glenn Lineberry, Director of the Arizona Student Opportunity Collaborative, and more importantly, Paul Luna's alma mater, exactly. <laughs> Miami High School. <laughs> and Dr. Marla Franco of the University of Arizona, who leads the state's Hispanic Serving Institutions Consortium. So we're gonna give each of the panelists eight minutes, really an opportunity to talk about their solutions and things that they're thinking about, um, and really kind of share that information so that we can have a quick snapshot. So we're gonna start with Glenn. I'm gonna give you the, I'll give you the, oh, he needs the. Glenn, would you wanna to come to the podium or do you wanna sure. talk up on the stage? Okay. So Glenn Lineberry. Thank you. I I'd like to start with um, an expression of appreciation to, uh, to Mr. Luna and Dr. Peralta and all the team at Helios. What you guys do is extraordinary, and the constant commitment to pushing things forward, I think, drives a lot of the conversation in the state, and we're all grateful. So I'm here because I am, try am starting something called the Arizona Student Opportunity Collaborative. This is a grassroots network. In a nutshell, what we're doing is we're paying, serving, highly qualified teachers already in rural appointments to teach an additional class, not unlike the way I sometimes pay my teachers to teach during their planning period. It's just that that class is then available online to any student in the state. And thanks to generous funding from Helios Foundation for our first two and a half years and now to an ESSER grant and the Toma Foundation, these courses are available at no cost to students, families, and schools. Right now, we're offering 39 courses. We have about 3,250 kids receiving instruction directly from our highly qualified teachers. Another 800 or so are using our curriculum that's facilitated by local teachers. And we have about 480 kids in new courses we've stood up, helping them and their families get through the FAFSA and college application processes. We're engaged in a process to expand, now that we have the ESSER funding and the TOMA grant, by fall, we should have doubled uh, the dual enrollment opportunities that we have. We'll have about 20 new academic electives. We're working with the College Board to roll out 12 AP courses statewide free to students and schools. And we're working with the Arizona CTE Curriculum Consortium to create student-facing courses based on their excellent teacher-facing curriculum. And thanks to the Toma Foundation, we have hired our first and are soon to hire our second school counselor who can provide college and career counseling, as well as do some initial screening for students in, in needing emotional counseling and help their local schools, many of whom can't find a counselor for staff, to figure out what kind of a referral is necessary. Now, we, put, we place a really high value on dual enrollment, and we see it doing four really important things. The first is that it increases the rigor of the curriculum that's available in the school. It elevates the teaching and the coursework that students are faced with. And this is important particularly in small schools where our teachers, for the most part, are teaching multiple classes. We don't have teachers who teach only calculus or teach only advanced government. So this is a big help. The second is that it exposes college uh, students, our high school students, to college level expectations. And it gets them there a little bit quicker. At, at our table during the, uh, the student and success coach conversation, we heard about a program at Mesa that's helping college students adapt to what's expected. And dual enrollment courses give us a ramp to that. Instead of kids running into that barrier, they've had that experience and they're readier mentally and academically for college. Then third, there's a reason we all know about, it, and that is if you leave college with a semester or two already on your transcript, you've done something for yourself. You may, maybe you've shortened it, maybe you'll get your degree in seven semesters or six with some summer work, or maybe if you're like I was when I left the Ozarks to go to university and I had to work 30 or 40 hours a week to pay for it, maybe you can take a course less each semester and have that additional time for, for work and for study. But more importantly for rural kids is that dual enrollment 
leaving high school with a successful college transcript means that the student and their families actually believe that the kids are ready to do college level work. Because here's the barrier that we really face in rural Arizona and, and, and across the country. I'm on the board of the Rural Educator publication and this is a national problem. And that's that students in rural areas, they don't not go to college because of finances. They don't not go to college because they can't get accepted. At Miami, we get every junior or senior who wants to go to college accepted and we get them all paid for one way or another. The barrier to attending college for rural students is what's called urban normativity. It's the idea that we all, no matter where we live, see the city as the norm. And the further you are from the city, culturally, geographically, whatever, the less normal. Think the way TV shows and movies portray rural characters, and you know exactly what I mean. It's not that those portrayals are inaccurate from the Ozarks. <laughs> it's just that it's not helpful. Um, and so what happens is that students and or their families have decided at some point along the way that college or really advanced vocational training just isn't for them. And these decisions, they don't happen in the 11th, 12th grade year. They happen when the kids are freshmen or fifth graders or at the baptismal font. And then everything we do to get kids pitched towards college or the right MOSs and officer of candidate school in the military or advanced vocational training, these folks, they don't even hear it because they have already ruled that out. It's a false dichotomy, but the belief is that that's just not for us, that we have to leave the community in order to do these things, and it's an insidious and significant barrier to students moving forward. So we have partnered at the collaborative with Prescott College, which is a private institution in Prescott. It's kind of a, nobody's here from Prescott College, right? Okay, it's kind of a grown-up hippie school. It's, <laughs> uh, it, it, and in fact, it's closely allied with, with a number of, of similar schools around the country and, and overseas. But it's rigorous, and they're firmly committed to dual enrollment for underserved students, both urban and rural. They're accredited by the Higher Learning Commission, so their credits transfer automatically to any of the state universities and they have an interesting ability to credential teachers. The Higher Learning Commission requires, to, in order to teach for college credit, you have a master's degree in the subject area, or you have a master's degree in 18 graduate hours in the area. And this is, this is a stumbling block for community colleges to credentialing dual enrollment teachers. What Prescott College has done, and they just put it in front of the HLC on their reaccreditation visit, is that they also credential teachers based on extensive work and teaching experience. At Miami, we had a teacher who had taught calculus for 19 years. Excellent teacher, didn't have the graduate hours. So Prescott College provisionally credentialed him to teach calculus, assigned a professor to monitor him and oversee him for the first couple of years before credentialing him directly. They're able to do the same thing in a lot of CTE and industrial areas. So this is how it works. Prescott approves our course submissions and our teacher's credentials. We take the year-long high school course and we embed the college portion in the spring semester. Like I teach an advanced novels course on the network. I have 14 students from 12 schools and I will never meet these kids. Right? So I, we start the year not knowing where they are. We spend the fall semester making sure every kid is ready to do college level work, and then the college course is taught during the spring semester. That gives us time to get the kids ready. Out of my 14 kids, with two of them, I had the difficult conversation that they could continue the course for English elective credit for high school, but that they weren't doing college level work. The other 12 were enrolled with Prescott College. The students there earn their high school credit towards graduation, as well as college hours that gets transcripted and transferred to the university. Tuition is $110 for four college credits, $27.50 per credit hour. My daughter graduated from ASU in 2021. This is a smoking deal. <laughs> there are some schools or local foundations that are paying these costs. At Miami, we actually ask our students and their families to pay for this because our experience is that a little bit of skin in the game means the, child, the kids are much more likely to actually complete the college portion of the course. So right now we have about 400 kids taking dual enrollment classes with Prescott College. We will be doubling the number of courses with them. Uh, we're offering 19 courses. Uh, we're adding about eight human, human electives, humanities electives. We're adding advanced chemistry and physics uh, and then we'll be adding, including some of the CTE programs, film and TV, stuff like that, that logically carry 
university credits. So that's what we're doing, and we're doing it because it's difficult for a lot of rural schools to access dual enrollment. If it involves traveling to the college campus, that may not be very close. And this entire project got started because Helios was willing to fund a project that grew out of our inability to get a small dual enrollment program going. I had teachers with master's degrees in English and math, Globe, had teachers with master's degrees in history and Spanish, and San Carlos, about 30 minutes away, inexplicably has a chemistry PhD on faculty. And we thought, hey, <laughs> we can have those five teachers teach a couple of dual enrollment courses each, and our kids can leave school with 30 credit hours under their belts. And you know, nobody ever said no. We just couldn't get everybody to say yes, and that's what Helios did, was they said yes. So, thank you. Thanks so much, Glenn. Inspiring. John, you're going to be next for us. John Arnold. <clears throat> thank you, Paul, and thank you. That was a, a really terrific uh, summary of what you're doing. We're, we're so grateful to be here today and thankful for Helios and Paul for bringing us all together. Um, the board has, has uh, made uh, post-high school attainment one of their top priorities for the last several, several years. So to get together and hear the stories and collaborate and communicate with one another is just critical to this work. Uh, Superintendent, thank you for being here. Glad you found Helios. Um, welcome to the party. Uh, they're fabulous. And so you just, you've learned that much so far, and there's a lot, there's a lot more there. They're, they're just incredibly deep. And, and we, we've enjoyed a long and productive partnership with them and really appreciate all the work they do. Um, you know, what Paul asked me to talk about, he said, uh, if there's one thing, you know, we want to look at, at attainment, there's one thing we should fund, what, 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 what's one of those things? Before I get into that, I just wanted to mention we've talked a lot about attainment as an opportunity for the state. Um, the board also views attainment as a, as a significant risk to the state, or lack thereof. Uh, there is already data that suggests that our state has reached its economical growth limits if we cannot expand attainment. There are thousands of jobs that go unfulfilled every single year in this state because we do not have the employees to take those jobs. You know, it's, we can create a job, but unless somebody takes it and fulfills that job, there's no economic gain from just creating an empty job. Uh, we, we need to address this, and we need to address it now. It is one of the top risks our state faces over the next decades. Um, recently, the board, through some legislation, began playing a, a much larger role in FAFSA, in FAFSA completion. And so we went, we went out and met with counselors, like, how, how can we do better with FAFSA completion? They said, we need more tools. We need no, more tools. And so we, we, we turned to Helios. We need to build some tools uh, for our counselors. And so uh, through a partnership with Helios and uh, National Data and the Department of Education, we've, we've launched a new uh, website called College Connect that is just a tool set for high school counselors that they can log into, they see their class list, we get the data from the Department of Ed so it's all pre-populated. They can uh, sort it by demographics and by, uh, by economic data, so family income, uh, and they can see who's filled out their FAFSA and who has not. They can see who started a FAFSA and who has not completed so they can go out and target students and get those FAFSAs completed. So we just launched it this year. Um, we've got a lot, a lot of interest from counselors and, and Moving through it. Um, so what do we do? How do, how do we improve um, attainment? Well, we live in this wonderful country that's, that's uh, built on a federalist system, so we have all these states out there that are experimenting in the same thing. Uh, through demographic changes, every state is looking at how do we improve attainment in our state, and there's a lot of states doing a lot of great work, so I just want to bring up one. There are roadmaps out there for us to follow. So this is Florida. Yay, Florida. <laughs> so you will look at some of this data going back to 2004 
they were about at the same place as Arizona. High school graduation rates, we were actually beating them, 77% to 72%. Today, we're at 76%. Florida's at 90. College going rates, we were at 48, they were at 53. We've bumped up to 50%, they're at 65. A bachelor degree completion. This is ninth graders, so what percentage of ninth graders complete a bachelor's degree within six years of high school graduation? So this includes kids that do not graduate from high school. In 2004, we were both at 15%. Today, we're at 19. Florida's at 28. So what did Florida do? What did Florida do? Well, one thing, Helios is there, so. <laughs> Thank you, Helios. I, I, I am not a, a, an expert on what Florida did. There are people that have studied that. There's a great deal of, of work that's been done out on the Florida success story. But they did employ one tool that several other states have also employed that without fail has demonstrated to impact all three of these metrics, high school graduation, college going, and bachelor degree, degree completion and that is financial aid. And not just little itty bitty looks at financial aid, it's massive investments in financial aid, both on the merit side and on the need-based side. Uh, Florida invested in the Bright Futures Scholarship Program. It is a merit-based program. It was launched in 1997. It took a few years for it to really take off. Started at $76 million. Today it's $623 million that Florida invests in this financial aid program. A comparable program in Arizona would be about $250 million or so. Uh, we're about 40% the size of Florida's K-12 system. Uh, Florida Student Assistance Grants, this is a need-based aid program. 2001, they nearly doubled the funding up to $73 million. And what that did is took the individual grants for each student and grew it about 40, 50% of what those students were getting. Close the gap between Pell and tuition and fees. Equivalent program in Arizona by about $110 million. So where, where are we at? Well, through a lot of work that our board has put in, partnerships with the legislature, we finally, 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 after years and years, and Rich has been on this for how many years, Rich? 30, 30 years. <laughs> we, we got into statute an Arizona Promise program. And the legislature gave us seven million bucks. <laughs> Yay! It, it's the the foot is in the door. The can the proverbial camel's nose. We're, we started it. We started it. Uh, the next year they added another twenty million dollars. This program is a very narrow box. It is need based aid only. It's about it's Pell it's Pell eligibility only, which family of four is about seventy thousand dollars or less. It's tuition and fees only. It's tuition and fees only. Uh, we were, I was just looking at some data, um, and, and this is pre-promise, so we'll see how this impacts things. Um, how do our Pell students do? So they, these are students that took all the right classes, they filled out the FAFSA, they applied for college, they were accepted to college, they got the Pell grant, um, of those students, what percentage actually go to college? It's only about 50%. 50%. So all these kids that did all those right things, these at-risk kids, and they're only at 50%. It's because they still need some help beyond what we're getting from Pell. Um, AZ Promise, so that we've got about 20 million now. The actual cost of implementing AZ Promise within those narrow parameters, about $135 million. Uh, so we're starting. The board, the board has said for now we will guarantee that other part. State's given us 20. We're doing the other 110 or so, and and we're asking our students. So we 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 use money from non-resident students to help subsidize these in-state students. That's that's the math of higher education right now. Uh, the governor has asked for another 80 million dollars towards this program. Uh, which would allow us to dramatically expand, look at, you know, that box, and then also bring in um, our Dreamer students. Uh, we're so grateful for our efforts on that front, and we're grateful for the general support. I think everybody in here recognizes the value and power 
of, of really institutionalized financial aid. We're seeing pockets of this all around the states. We've heard some examples of communities coming together to provide promise type programs for their students, especially at the community college level. A statewide initiative so that a sixth, seventh grade student, these students who are in Miami, I say Miami, I don't I think I'm saying it wrong. Yeah. <laughs> wrong my whole life, but um, which is okay, it's good to be wrong. Um, so that a sixth, seventh grade student, when they start thinking about their lives, you know, the college is on that map. You know, and what I'm afraid of is right now, sixth, seventh, eighth grade student, they, they, college is not in their plans. They just, they don't think they can go. And they, they need that consistent message. They need to understand, our families need to understand that their student can go to college. If they put in the work, if they do their part, they can go to college. And that, and that message has to reach down into our sixth, seventh, and eighth graders. So that, that is when they are making those academic decisions that put them on a path to college or not. Um, talking to juniors and seniors is too late. You know, it's, it's great, but it's too late. We, we, and that, that messaging has to be at that statewide uh, level so everybody, everybody gets that message and understands it. Thank you. Thank you, John. And as you can see, we, one of the reasons we've kind of put this panel together is we started with Glenn thinking about, you know, what can happen in the schools um, and, you know, opportunities for rigorous courses and that strong curriculum. You know, we went with John, who then talked a, little, talked a lot about funding and, you know, what are the differences that we saw in that Florida growth into what we can do for Arizona and now what's happened with the Arizona Promise. And now I want to transition to uh, Dr. Marla Franco to talk about the work that's happening at the universities and where we go from there. So, Dr. Franco. Thank you, everyone. I'm actually going to bring the mic down with me because I'm a roamer when I present. <laughs> um, so thank you all very much. It's been, I think, a high energy uh, morning with a lot of critical conversations informed by the data. So certainly thank you to Helios Education Foundation, Education Forward Arizona for really bringing this critical mass of, of data to inform, to keep informing the North Star and the strategies around this work. Uh, so once again, my name is Marla Franco, and I serve as the inaugural Vice President of Hispanic Serving Institution Initiatives at the University of Arizona. I'm also co-founder of the AZHSI Consortium, and I'm so excited to be able to share a lot more about the consortium's work, um, who's behind it, and what we hope to achieve. The consortium's work is actually supported by the Helios Education Foundation, as well as the Arizona Community Foundation. So collectively, those partners really help support financially a solid year for us to build a solid base of foundation. Um, I am a first-generation college graduate. Um, I often say that I love school so much that I have earned three degrees uh, with that passion. But education, and particularly having an advanced degree, changed the trajectory of my life, that of my family, that of my community, and really serves as a base of inspiration for not only what I do, but most importantly, how I do it. So before, earlier when we had gotten started this morning, I was chit-chatting with Paul Luna in the lobby. And while I love data and I love a good report, I love action even better. On my phone, I actually have a screensaver and it says, get it done. Because that is what I feel inspired to do day in and day out. So while I'm here absolutely to share a little bit of work about the consortium, we're here to talk about the report, we're here to talk about the data. I don't know about you, but I'm here to get it done, right? So I want to provide a little bit of framing 
um, into the work and into why we are prioritizing the scope of work through the AZHSI consortium. So let me first actually tell you a little bit about what a Hispanic serving institution is. So it's actually a federal designation that comes by way of the US Department of Education. And there's one primary set of criteria that identifies what an HSI is. And that is based on enrollment. So colleges and universities across the nation that have at least 25% undergraduate Hispanic enrollment are federally designated as a Hispanic serving institution. Unbeknownst to many, there's actually not a single penny that comes to those institutions by way of that federal designation. But it does open the door to compete and vie for federal and foundation grant dollars that might be specifically earmarked to support and accelerate access and degree attainment at Hispanic serving institutions. Across the nation, there are 559 Hispanic serving institutions. That number of HSIs has grown exponentially from year to year. And in the state of Arizona, that number has increased uh, significantly, having jumped from 16 uh, to 20 in just uh, a two year period. So here in the state of Arizona, we have 20 Hispanic serving institutions, certainly a mix of four years as well as two year community colleges. And I thought to myself, right, we are in, oops, oops, I got excited and I pressed the button. Okay, so I think it's important for us to understand the context of Arizona, right? So do we know and do we, do we understand that we are actually in a state that has the fifth largest Latino population in the United States? Look at our K through 12 population. We are nearly comprised 50% of Latinos in the K through 12, right, in the state of Arizona. We also, if you look closely at the report, it is undeniably so that there are some segments of our population within the state of Arizona, right, that dramatically do not have access and opportunity to higher education, nor the support to really cross the threshold of completion. So we, have, we see college enrollment and completion rates that are racially and socioeconomically stratified, right? That is happening. And there's an ecosystem around that. So what if I told you that there are 20 HSIs in the state of Arizona who are coming together just as fiercely as I'm communicating to you all today. There's actually 19, 19 others of us that are passionate about accelerating both access, transfer success, and degree completion, certificate completion in the state of Arizona focused on this large proportion of Arizonans. We feel that the intention behind these ideas is one of many key ingredients coupled by what we heard already on this panel that really will accelerate the type of educational attainment that we know Arizona is capable of and we know that Arizona passionately, dramatically needs, correct? So I'm super excited to share a little bit about the work of the consortium. So 20 HSIs in the state of Arizona have banded together as a community of practice. And around that community of practice, we've committed to the idea that going at this as a collective body of higher education institutions will help advance this work leap, leaps and bounds greater than if we achieve, than what we may have achieved individually, right? So this community of practice is committed to the exchange of evidence-based practices known to really move the needle around degree attainment for Latino students in the state of Arizona. We also are committed to really bringing to fruition and exchanging training and professional development opportunities across the state for our faculty, 
our staff, and also providing student engagement opportunities that really bring students from all those institutions together in a way where we can really kind of share the resources that each, each of our institutions individually has and bringing them to really a collective pot. So what if I told you that there were 20 Arizona colleges and universities committed to accelerating educational access and degree attainment among Latino students? We're doing the work. I'm super excited to say that in 2021, we did a soft launch. It was during the pandemic and we brought all the presidents and chancellors and senior level leaders together from across those Hispanic serving institutions. And we said, we have this idea. And we said collectively, if we put these aims forward to launch a consortium, is it something that would be of value collectively to this community of HSIs? Could it help you identify some of the opportunities that still might exist to accelerate degree attainment at your respective institutions? We wanted to make sure that there was a sense of consensus and energy around that work across the state. Folks said, yes, I'm in, let's do it. We were able to have a, an opportunity to connect with the Helios Education Foundation, invited to submit a proposal, and that really began the launch of the H HSI Consortium. These are actually the list of 20 um, Hispanic serving institutions in the state of Arizona, representing a collective enrollment of nearly 100,000 Arizona Hispanic undergraduate students. And that's just at the undergraduate level. Um, myself, along with my colleague who's here in the audience, Dr. Ray Rivera, president of Estrella Mountain Community College, we are the co-conspirators behind this. And we have several people in the audience um, who have really rallied uh, with us to be part of this collective community in the state. One of the things that we really doubled down on that that was supported by the grant this past year are two things. One is we actually hosted an inaugural summit in the fall of 2022 um, on Dr. Rivera's uh, amazing, beautiful campus, Estrella Mountain Community College. And we actually convened um, nearly 200 faculty, staff, students, and community partners for a one-day summit. That really had people engaging in some very rigorous conversation and strategizing around some collective opportunities moving forward to advance the consortium. We also launched this past year what's called the AZ HSI Consortium Evidence-Based Practice. And I think that that's kind of what helps connect the dots in this conversation. Um, I was just telling John, I think, earlier during a break, um, I often say, you know, people, if, if I seem uh, both passionate and um, impatient, you, you probably have me pegged. And the impatience is connected to my passion, but I'm impatient about when we're going to really accelerate the needle towards, towards advancing on these efforts. And so what if I told you that we just launched a process to both catalog and disseminate a list of evidence-based practices known to move the needle on educational access and attainment at Arizona HSIs. We need to know what the, what the strategies are and the evidence behind them so that we can understand where the opportunities are to really double down and accelerate. So this is my question to you. Are you ready to double down on a networked approach with Arizona Hispanic serving institutions. I think we're all asking, are you ready to double down collectively on these strategies? Something has to happen. And I think I, along with many of you, are ready to accelerate and get into make it happen mode. I know I am. I'm re I'm, my heels are on, my sleeves are, all, are rolled up, so I'm ready to go to work. So it's a pleasure to, to share more about the consortium and I look forward to connecting with you all. Thank you.